so Brittany, are you ready? All right. It's you guys all the time, the puppies. You under the puppies. Okay, I'm done. Bye. <laughs> Hi. Good afternoon. I want to know who I'm talking to. I know earlier today, Rebecca asked, you know, who we have sitting in the crowd. So how many people are ranchers or stewards? Some land. Okay. How many people are artisans? How many people are girls? <laughs> okay, and boys? And everything else you want to identify as. Um, I just, I 
I'm so pleased to be here, and it's a privilege. Thank you so much. And it's a privilege to be here as um, a profiling a shepherdess, uh, a modern-day shepherdess. So, a modern-day shepherdess. Let's go back in time. What was a shepherdess of the past? I don't know if I have my slides. Yeah. One second. Yeah, sorry. Oh, it's fine. I can take up time. Okay, so I just wanted to be clear when you got to see that film, there are sheep and goats in those herds. We call them flirts. And when I refer to my flirts, I sometimes say herds. And it's not because I don't like sheep, it's because goats uh, get very cranky if they're not front and center. <laughs> so I'm gonna refer to um, the, the herds I work with um, because it's a mixed species. I guess we can talk about flirts, that's fine too. Um, we run, we run about 2,000 head in the East Bay, uh, actually all over the Bay Area. We split our herds of about 2,000 into groups of about 500. And what we do is we move these animals around to do very specific target grazing. Um, we do this for fire abatement as well as um, undesirable plant uh, control, invasive species control. Um, and we've been doing this for a number of years. I really want to talk about the shepherdess of the past, so we're almost there. All right, so I'm here uh, to talk about ancient futures, and I'm profiling a shepherdess, and that's kind of big shoes to fill, but I'll see what I can do. So the shepherdess of the past, defined by some dictionary, I found it somewhere, was a romantic nomadic pastoral maiden. <laughs> A modern day shepherdess. I try not to take myself too seriously in trying to fit that role, <laughs> but I do. A modern day shepherdess is one who not only enjoys the wonders of the great outdoors, the jollies of the animals we tend to, witnessing the changes of seasons from year to year, but we have to wear many hats. It's not like the past, it's right now, and that means uh, I, I don't just get to be on the ground with animals all the time. I gotta talk to a lot of people and talk them into this great idea of using animals on the land. Uh, I speak many languages. I'm fluent in Spanish and I get to commute, communicate, um, actually speak more Spanish on the job than I do um, English sometimes and I also speak uh, Border Collie. Um, so I'm not just a shepherd of the land and the animals, but I am also a shepherd of people and projects. And I think that that's one of the most important things to distinguish today is that as modern day shepherds and shepherdesses, or shepherd die, as I'm gonna say, we have a lot of different roles to play. And I think that people and the projects that we uh, perform are, are very important. Okay, next. So um, that segment that you saw um, was profiling me doing my job with an outfit called Star Creek Co. Land Stewards. Star Creek Company is a contract grazing and land stewardship enterprise with a mixed species flirts of sheep and goat, as I said. We do uh, grazing in, in places where most people wouldn't think to graze. We graze around uh, homes, very close to homes grazing about 100 foot fuel breaks around homes. This is a homeowners association uh, in Hayward where we have our flirt. This is a, a beautiful uh, view of us actually moving one of our flirts to one location to another in the East Bay Regional Parks District. Uh, and that, what you see there is, uh, I believe also, uh, Hayward Union City. We move our animals with gooseneck trailers, sometimes double, double uh, semi livestock trailers. And this is the team I work with. Over here we have um, our lovely crew of uh, Peruvian herders that are dear friends of mine. This is an avid land steward uh, ship. Um, he's, he's my mentor and he's also the owner of the company. His name's Pete Polis. And then up there on the left, that's Emilio Huarte. He's a fifth generation uh, shap, uh, Basque sheep man. All right, so let's keep on going. But perhaps most of all who I like to work with the most are the dogs. And so I have to make sure that the dogs get their light. Next. We can stop here. 
this was an awesome job. We, uh, we got to graze the Albany uh, bulb. I don't know if anyone knows what that is or where it is, but it's right there on the bay, and it's a very unique place, uh, kind of post-apocalyptic, and a very weird place for livestock to be, but we did it, and we did it well. So a lot of us already know the challenges at hand uh, being in the sheep industry um, and being a rancher or farmer in general. Um, I don't want to go into them because I like to talk about happy things most of the time. Um, but we do know that most of the ranchers and farmers in our country are of 55 and above. I don't have the stats exactly because they're changing all the time. But um, we, we, as new generation shepherds and shepherd I have big uh, shoes to fill because there's not so many of us. The, oh, and, and if we could step back to that one. I just wanted to give a nod, very big nod, to the most, mostly men of, uh, of the legacy of sheep in the West. Uh, the Basque culture is very, very strong uh, in the West uh, when it comes to sheep, and I wanted to be sure to show some really awesome images of folks who had my job title before me. So the current climate in the industry poses many challenges in which we folk as shepherds and shepherd eye of the land, animals and people have the opportunity to be courageous, creative, innovative, nimble, persistent, and arising to the occasion in bringing the sheep industry to one that is once again thriving. So how are we gonna do that? So we, we're working in a landscape in the sheep industry that's changing. How do we adapt? <laughs> Adaptation means we need, like I said, be nimble and creative and innovative. And I think the way in which we can look at having uh, feasible enterprises is looking at stacked enterprises. So this group, we're going to talk a lot about wool, and I'm going to try to emphasize mostly my talk to wool, but I have to recognize both meat and contract grazing as other avenues in the sheep industry. So right now, I work with meat and contract grazing specifically in my enterprise because we actually run hair sheep. However, I am a big fan of wool sheep, the fiber sheep, and so I'm going to find a way to get that into my, my program at some point. So, shepherding in the 21st century and beyond means what kind of tools could we use to make our organization, communication, operations, and documentation more simple and streamlined? This is never to say that we have to abandon our analog tools. We'll never put down our pen and paper, our clipboards, our wall calendar, or even the crook. We need those tools. We need to talk to one another and share our experiences our, our wisdom, things that others have taught us, and we need to share. So I want to be sure when I talk about technological tools, we're not turning our backs to those uh, analog tools. But there are already technologies out there that we can embrace in, in the sheep industry to help us do our jobs better, and also to get more of our stories out there to uh, potential folks who want to wear our wares or whatever it may be. So why am I up here talking about technology? I'm a shepherdess. I usually have poop on my feet. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm very interested in uh, grass-fed, sustainably produced meat. I went to a thing called a hackathon, which was called Hack Meat in Silicon Valley at the D School uh, at Stanford, where people from all different industries came and sat down to talk about uh, how can technology help some of the issues in the good meat business or good meat world, rather. Uh, there were tech people, developers, designers, there were ranchers, there were entrepreneurs, politicians, things like wonderfully diverse group of people. So there I learned that there's so many great ideas out there. And uh, I got really excited about the people I met. I met General Assembly, which is basically a tech school in San Francisco. I applied to this silly scholarship thinking that maybe they'd give me a scholarship. They thought, why don't we give a scholarship to a shepherdess and see what she has? So I got this scholarship for General Assembly to take a product development course. And that's really awesome because I can take a concept, take it to the course, and by the end of the course, I'll have this, this, uh, this tool ready to go into development. So somewhere along the line, uh, Amber and Rebecca 
first Amber, then Rebecca, we got to uh, share notes. Um, and Rebecca and Amber were really interested in what kind of technological tools I was interested in developing. And then we started talking about the California Wool Mill Project and what kind of technologies could be adapted specifically to this wool mill. So I just want to make sure all y'all know I'm not up here uh, touting myself as an expert, uh, but I'm a pioneer. So technological tools of uh, uh, software for the future of the sheep industry. Here we go. What are we trying to achieve? Well, we know this really well. I think we can all sing this song in our heads. Um, we want resilient operations that are economically feasible, healthy for our animals, regenerative to the land, and build, build thriving family dynamics. And that's not just our blood family, but our friend family and our community family. Okay, so how are we gonna do this? Well, we have to look at what we're trying to do. We have to make livelihoods. We want to, of course, have the lifestyle of being land stewards and animal uh, tenders, but we have to have business models that are going to allow for us to, to, uh, to be able to, to live. So um, in talking about business imperatives, these are the things we're trying to focus on when we're building our programs. We need to improve efficiency in operations. Pro we need to have products or service or differentiation, meaning we need to have something really special about what we're bringing to the world. And then we also need our customers to have connection to what we are um, providing. That's connection. <laughs> so wool. Specifically, the California Wool Mill Tracking Tool is a technology that can address some of these business imperatives or, or our underlying goal, and what we're trying to do in using technology adapted to uh, what we're doing next. So this tool is in, in concept, it's an idea, but this is what this tool could potentially do. It can track inventory of the raw material from the rancher to either where it goes before it goes to the wool mill or directly to the wool mill. Uh, it can track the information that will be uh, the data compiled to create the soil to skin LCA that was already described and will be further uh, developed uh, throughout the day. And it, this uh, can also help to share the story with quantifiable measures, not only the origin of the raw material, but the producers' practices for managing their flocks on their land. Now this is where earlier in the day uh, becomes very relevant, because if we can harness these models that are being developed and all of the data that has been um, compiled, if we can figure out a model that can be plugged into this tool, then we'll have a, a very easy applicable interface for uh, farmers and ranchers to plug that information in and either use it as marketing tools or perhaps some sort of uh, economic incentive for the way we, we manage our animals. So, how am I on time? Okay, I'm gonna move on a little bit quickly. Uh, can we go to the barcode, please? Barcode, uh, top left. Baco, yep, that one. All right, and I'm going to refresh that, please. All right, so I wanted to show you a tracking tool that's already out there, and it's pretty cool, and it's from New Zealand. <laughs> now, most of us know that New Zealand does a great job at what it does. However, we do great jobs at what we do, and we need to get with the times and do the best we can do to, to harness what we have to offer and, to, and creating a, uh, a more regional or local um, market for our <coughs> So the bulk code's interesting. So let's say you buy a product and you want to know where it comes from. You trace the bulk code, you put your code in there, trace it, and then, it's, and then it starts going back into the whole entire production line. And wait, there it is. The source of your icebreaker, whatever it is. Can you press the Branch Creek Station where our whatever it is came from? Awesome, there's a video about the guys who did it. Okay, can you go up to our place? Wow, there's a location, the number of stock, the area, the altitude, the fiber production. You can keep on going up there in the location. You can learn about more about the location. You can learn about the family. You can explore more. 
And down here you can see the environmental ethics, manufacturing ethics, animal welfare. We can totally do that and we can do that specific to here and specific to the California wool mill. And we can do it, I'm not gonna say better, but different. So this is just an idea or a tool that's already out there. Patagonia also has a really, really awesome campaign itself uh, in, in wool. We don't need to watch the movie, you can watch it, but I just wanted to make sure that I show you what else is out there. So the tracking concept is out there and it's out there for a lot of different things. So we'll keep on going. So what I actually wanted to just show here that the icebreaker program or the icebreaker production line is pretty neat and they do a good job to do their sourcing, their producing, processing. However, look, it goes to China and then it goes to France and then it goes to a German spinning plant and then it somehow comes to us, which they really do a great job at making sure they do the best they possibly can. But what if we can streamline that to all be here now? <laughs> Next. So um, there's another tracking technology out there, and hay, the hay industry is doing a great job at this. So they have a system where they can just scan those bales, the time of it was harvested, the time it was distributed. Um, actually, the moisture content data is the most important thing. And so you can see these are just ticked off from their website, of uh, the, the things that that tracking device does. We can be informed by technologies already out there, and with a little tweaking, we can make them fit to our uses. This is the hay crop manager. I like the guy, the strong farmer guy. <laughs> okay, tools for other revenue streams of the sheep industry. I'm gonna move through these pretty fast, and pardon me any vegetarians, I'm quite the meat eater, and I wanna make sure that we know about <laughs> That, that, that is a part of a, a potential um, staffed enterprise of our uh, businesses. I'm sure many of you already have this dialed in. Um, MeetLink was uh, actually a tool that was concepted at this hack meet, and that's actually got me what got me into the idea of thinking about tools that we can make. Because, for example, the, uh, the slaughterhouse industry or the processing plant industry is a little bit behind times in terms of how they schedule uh, your harvesting, and it gets really tricky if any of you have taken your animals to get harvested. Um, scheduling can be a big issue. So MeetLink was a concept that basically became a scheduling client management uh, Google Cal for harvesting animals. And uh, that concept is, is could be developed out, but more uh, importantly and more excitingly, the California Wool Mill Tracking Project is what I want to throw my back into. Next. Morris Grassbed is a really awesome, awesome uh, grassbed company down in Santa Cruz County, I believe. And they've done a really great job uh, of having an online uh, platform to buy their meat. And I'm sure many of you are also familiar with that. Um, oh, go Morris Grassbed. <laughs> Again? Okay, con contract grazing. I know this is the best, so I can talk on, so I'm reel me in. Um, but contract grazing is something that is in high demand. It is insane how much demand there is because the West needs it. Think of all the fires that we had this last summer. Think of all the fires that we've had in the West the last decade. And it's most likely going to continue. So whatever we can do, whatever measures we can do to reduce the impact of those fires or just to be prepared, we got to do them. And there's alternative ways to guys with weed whippers out there making kind of the noise pollution we don't really care for, putting carbon into the atmosphere, you know, things that are petroleum based. There's an alternative, and that is grazing animals on the ground. We do the trickiest, weirdest grazing projects. You have no idea. <laughs> what, this is actually not that strange. That's a very normal, you know, goat scene. But what we do sometimes is we go in the urban periphery, say in Oakland or Berkeley, and we're trying to get these big double semi trucks in, and we have to close down traffic both ways with our dogs and our friends, and you know, a goat gets out, or mostly the goats get out. Goat gets out, my friend Juan throws his lasso, gets it, there's traffic, there's people, it's just, it's all over the place. So you can understand why a contract grazing business would need a very 
spunky, loud, big little person like myself to solve problems because there's a lot of them. And I'm saying that there is a lot of this business, but it's very tricky, very complicated, and a lot of risk. But I think that I'd like to say I'd like to encourage more people who want to be next generation shepherds or shepherd eye to look at maybe this being the potential of a stacked grazing uh, enterprise next. So uh, I just wanted to point out, this doesn't look like it was grazed, but we did such a nice job. It just looks like a nice carpet. That was like three or four feet of annual grasses that was a mess. And we did a nice job, um, I believe, by just creating this nice mowed carpet um, by doing dense, dense grazing. So we have a lot of animals in a tight space for very little time. It's a lot of work because we have to build fences twice a day at least, and sometimes we move them twice a day. So with four time, with uh, 450 animals, uh, we can go through about an acre and a half to two acres a day, depending on the density of the vegetation. We run sheep and goats because sheep are grazers and goats are browsers. We get to have a very, very thorough job done when we go in places where we have both grass and we have things like coyote brush, blackberry, poison oak, whatever it may be. Uh, thistle, it's incredible what they can do with thistle. So that's why we have these flirts. Next. So right here, um, you can see on the right, we had just grazed on the left. We hadn't grazed yet. Looks like someone took a nap or something over there. Um, now this was really an important job because it was basically a tunnel, uh, a fuel tunnel, I think they, the fire captain calls them, and uh, right up at the top of that, that canyon were a whole bunch of really nice homes. And so the park district makes sure that they make their grazing plans with us with these tunnels in mind. And um, we do our best to, to be careful about erosion. These were lo loose soils, so it was really tricky to make sure that they were in there long enough to get the, the, the vegetation down, um, but they were, um, but they didn't spend too much time there to have a negative impact on the soils. Next. We, like I said, we graze in very interesting places. <laughs> this is us getting ready to load up in the morning in Oakland, or excuse me, yeah, it's Oakland, Redwood Park, if anyone's familiar. Amazing place, we had two herds there, we had about close to 800 animals plus, and we had, I don't know, six dogs, four Anatolian Pyrenees mixes, two herders, me, and uh, lots of water trucks. Next. So I just wanted to say there is a demand for this work, the contract raising aspect, which I think is going to be uh, more and more, more and more uh, uh, outfits are going to be doing this, but it's, like I said, I keep on saying it's hard. So what I would like to do is build a tool that I would use that will <coughs> help me track all the variables of my work. Basically, I have four herds, and they're being trucked every one to two weeks. That means I have to make sure I have the transport ready to go uh, when we need to go. And sometimes they go faster, and sometimes they go more slow. But we can't have those animals in there too long because we don't want them hungry and we don't want to have an impact on the land. So it's very like this all the time. So um, what I would like to do is build this tool so others who come into the business will have a template or a model to organize all the different factors and the variables. So it's basically, uh, I can't say plug and play because it's not that easy, but there's already a tool that can be uh, help to build a replicable model which I think we should all think about when we're building our systems for our businesses. Next. So to conclude, at the end of the day, the most important tool we have as shepherds of our animals and our lands, really beyond having a cool app on your tablet, is to slow down and observe. And that's the biggest tool we all have in life, really. Uh, our eyes, ears, mouth, nose, and touch will always be the most important tools we could ever use. It's important to know of the legacy of the sheep and the sheep men and women of the West. And to learn from the past to take the ancient wisdom shared with us into the future. And are we stuck? Many thanks. <laughs> I have to take I have to take a, a second just to 
let you know how important gratitude is in this work because it gets very hard and frustrating. And everything I know is through my experience and working with the people who taught me to be who I am. Um, so my efforts really is my team. Keep Polis and Amelia Warte and the Peruvian herders and the many dogs that have more patience than myself. And I want to also thank Rebecca and Amber, the Fibershed community, the local Point Reyes community, which I am hoping will be my home someday. <laughs> and is there anything else after that? Oh yes, and um, please contact me if you have any questions, because I think this is really important. A, a symposium is a great place to network and to share uh, ideas and dreams, and this will be my moment to say I'm vetting uh, folks for who have any interest in, in partnerships, uh, interest in uh, learning more, and I'm looking for land lease opportunities as well regionally. Um, I'm so grateful to be here, and um, thank you very much.